Good morning. So we're done Romans, and today we begin a new study that falls under the overall title of being reformed in an unreformed world. And the goal of this series is simply this, to explore how do we apply the truths of our faith to the world we live in. That's the essence of what it means to be reformed. How do we as the people of God engage a growingly sec uh, secular culture? How do we as the people of God call wayward churches, wayward people, a wayward culture to a real and life-changing engagement? with the person of Jesus. As I presently envision it, this brief series will focus primarily on two books of the Bible, the book of Jonah and the account of a man who got this very wrong, and the book of Daniel, the account of Daniel and his friends who got being reformed in an unreformed world. Very, very right. So today we, we start with Jonah. And I want you to know this, even though we often think of Jonah as a children's story, Jonah is deep, deep theology. Deep theology that shows us the truth of who we are and the truth of who God is. Now, I'll be the first to admit there are some fable-like children's story qualities to the book of Jonah. After all, what are fables? They're stories that are used to teach great truths in a simple way. And we're certainly going to see powerful truths in our study of the book of Jonah. But at the same time, we need to remember this. Jonah is a real historical account of a real historical person. We don't just read about Jonah in the book that's titled after his name. We also find a mention of him in the history of Israel in 2 Kings 14.25 where he is called a prophet of the Lord to the nation of Israel. But now, as we come to the book of Jonah, God is recommissioning him to a new purpose, to be a prophet of God to a pagan, sinful people, the people of Nineveh. He is to go and proclaim a gospel of repentance to them. You know, the book of Jonah is a book that really is all about sin, and yet the word sin never appears in it once. There are 806 times the word sin appears in the Old Testament, but not one of those times is in the book of Jonah. But the book of Jonah is not just about sin. It's about God's unrelenting grace that pursues us even as we try to run from him. In the verses we're looking at today, even though the word sin is never used, we can learn a lot about sin. We we get a glimpse into what sin really is. We get a glimpse as to how our sin separates us from God and what our sin does to us. And we see how God in his grace deals with our sin. We learn all that just from these first 10 verses of the book of Jonah. Hear the word of the Lord from Jonah 1, 1 to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amatai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God, Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. But they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you from? 
And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So this morning, let's start by looking and seeing in this passage what sin really is. And I want to make it very simple for us. We can see it here. Sin is walking in the opposite direction of what God has called you to do. Jonah 1, 1 to 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the evil they have done has come up before me. Now, as you know, the way this account unfolds, Jonah has no interest in answering God's call on his life. And we can see it here. He goes in the opposite direction from the direction God's calling him to go. It reminds me of a favorite picture I have of two of my grandchildren, in the picture, we're walking down a garden path in Florida, and these two young grandchildren are running away from me. And my grandson is looking back at me as if he's saying, catch me if you can. As I called to them to come back to us, they ran faster and faster to get away. That's what Jonah's doing here with God. Do you see that phrase at the beginning of verse one? The word of the Lord came to Jonah. In the Old Testament, that's always the language that God uses as a prophet is being raised up to bring a message from God to God's people. That's what God's calling Jonah to do here, to be a prophet to Nineveh. And instead of heeding that call on his life, Jonah runs in the exact, opposite direction. Why? Why doesn't Jonah just do what God called him to do? A lot of times we think Jonah ran because he was afraid of what the Ninevites might do to him if he went and told them to repent and told them of God's coming judgment. It probably might have been rough on him and he envisioned that. I mean, think about it. If we do put it in our context today, maybe we can be a little more sympathetic to Jonah if we're thinking this way. Of course he'd be scared. Imagine if God told you or me to go to Iran or San Francisco for that matter and stand in the city center and proclaim a message of repentance, calling people out for their sin. If that's what God called me to do instead of be here in Sturgis, South Dakota, I'm pretty sure I'd be doing my best to figure out a way to run in the opposite direction, but look good in the process. It's logical to conclude that Jonah did this because he was afraid of the Ninevites, but that's not why. I am convinced that Jonah wasn't afraid of the Ninevites. He was afraid of God and what God would do. We'll talk about this more in the weeks to come, but just take a glance ahead at Jonah 4.2. Jonah prays to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, do you see in that verse what Jonah's really afraid of? He's afraid of God and that God would be merciful and actually forgive the Ninevites. Why would Jonah be afraid of that? Because Jonah hated the Ninevites. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and Assyria was Israel's most feared enemy. They were ruthless, wicked, horrible people who were a threat to Israel's security. In fact, as you look at history, about 100 years after Jonah proclaimed the gospel to them and called them to repent, they would indeed come in and annihilate Israel and carry them off into captivity. So what Jonah and the, the rest of the Israelites wanted for Assyria and Nineveh was for them to be destroyed completely, to be wiped off the face of the earth so they would no longer be a threat to the peace and security of Israel. Jonah didn't want to give these people a chance to repent. He wanted God to get them before they got Israel. Think of it from Jonah's perspective. 
Israel is God's chosen people. Therefore, Jonah expects God to destroy Israel's enemies, not save them. For Jonah, these are strange orders that God gives to him, and there's no explanation. And since he doesn't like the strange orders, he runs from them. Our God, if you think about it, is a God who's always given us strange orders. At least they seem strange from a human perspective. And that should be the case, shouldn't it? If we have a God who's so simple that he never crosses us, never calls us to do something we don't want to do, then he's not much of a God at all. We're the God. But our God describes himself this way in Isaiah 55, 8, 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Think about all the seemingly strange orders that we see God give out on the pages of our Bibles. For example, what did God tell Noah to do? To build an ark on dry land when it had never rained before. God told Abraham to leave his home with no explanation about where Abraham was to go. God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, Isaac, the son through whom all the promises God had made to Abraham were to be fulfilled. God told them to sacrifice Isaac. God told the Israelites to walk through the Red Sea as they left Egypt. He told them to cross the Jordan while it was still at full flood stage as they entered the promised land. He told them to march around the city of Jericho for seven days to conquer the city. And then we come to Jesus, the strangest order of all. God told Jesus, his own son, to give up his life as a ransom for many so that God's elect people could have eternal life. Strange orders. But all these heroes of the faith are heroes of the faith because what did they do? They embraced God's strange orders. They went where God sent them and did what God told them to do, but not Jonah. Because Jonah didn't like these strange orders that God gave him, Jonah tried to run from God, flee from his presence. You know, there's only two groups of people in the world, and you need to decide and understand which group you're actually in. There are those who are running from God and those who are running to God. Which group are you in? How do you know which group you're in? Well, Stop and think about the strange orders that Jesus has given to us and ask yourself, do I run to these orders or do I find ways to run from them? For example, Jesus said to love our enemies and bless those who persecute us. Do we run to that or run from it? He calls us to give generously, to give of ourselves to others as he gave of himself to us. That means giving everything we've got. Do we run to that or from that? He calls us to be humble and consider others better than ourselves. Do we run to that or from it? He calls us to die to ourselves so we can find real life in him. Do we do that or run from that? It's a very strange order. But if you think about it, those orders are not very different from what God gave to Jonah. God wanted Jonah to love enemies that were a threat to Jonah's homeland. He wanted Jonah to be generous and give of himself to help others find life and have it to the full. He wanted Jonah to humble himself and serve not just God, but the Ninevites, his enemies. The whole book of Jonah is about God's call to Jonah to die to himself and his own desires, to die to his pride, and to find real life, living out God's call, to have mercy and compassion on the lost. This is what it looks like for a person who is being reformed in an unreformed world. The first thing that needs to get reformed is us. We can't reform the world until we've been reformed by being conformed 
to the image of Christ, to live like Jesus. Where Jonah set his face to flee from God's call, Christ set his face to run to God's call. Luke 9, 51, when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, to go and follow God's strange orders. Do we set our face to do that? Or do we turn our face from God and flee? Are we running to engage a culture that is hostile to our faith? Or do we run in the opposite direction? seeking to wall ourselves up inside our homes, inside our church, and be insulated from everything going on around us for the security and comfort that we desire so desperately. Are we running from God's call on our life? Jonah's problem is really a problem of identity, if you look at it. And that's what our sins rooted in, not understanding our real identity. What did Jonah see about himself? He saw himself as a Jew first, a Jewish nationalist, if you will. That was what was most important. And being a servant of God was second to that. He was filled with pride and self-righteousness about who he was and who his people were. And he wanted what he wanted rather than what God wanted. He wanted the Ninevites to get what he thought they deserved, to get what he thought should be coming to them. He didn't want God to spare them. He wanted God to wipe them out. He didn't want to give them an opportunity to repent and turn to God. He wanted God to destroy them. Now, I want you to understand this because we, we often blame Satan for our sin, right? But it wasn't Satan that made Jonah run. It was his misunderstanding, his identity, and what was really important in life. But Satan did provide the boat that allowed Jonah to flee from the presence of the Lord. We need to understand this. If we're running from God, it's not Satan's fault. And it's not God's fault, certainly. It's our fault. It's us carrying out our natural inborn desires to run in the opposite direction from God as far and as fast as we can. We're born to run because we're born in sin. We're corrupt in our nature. We want nothing to do with the holy God. James 1, 13 to 15 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, he gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown gives birth to death. Do you see what James is saying? When we sin, when we run from God, it's not the devil making us do it. It's all us and our own evil desires, our own misunderstanding of our identity and purpose in life. Rather than wanting what God desires, what do we want? We want our own way, our own time, our own peace, our own comfort, our own security, our own prosperity, and especially our own righteousness. Sin is us doing what comes very naturally to us, running from God, running from God's ways, because what is God's way? For God, the way up is to first go down. We want no part of going down. We just want to go up. We want to elevate ourselves. When we choose to sin, when we choose to run from God, Satan will always provide a boat to take us where we want to go. If we harbor impure thoughts, Satan will provide the bed for those thoughts to be acted out on. If we harbor resentment toward others, Satan will provide the rock for us to throw. If we harbor envy, Satan will provide the opportunity for us to steal. If we harbor feelings of self-pity, Satan will give us reasons to feel sorry for ourselves. If we harbor anger, Satan will give us reasons to be angry. And if we harbor self-righteousness and pride, Satan will give us people to look down on and scorn, just as Jonah looked down on the Ninevites and scorned them.
like Jonah, we need to understand this. We are born to run from God. It's what comes naturally to us. God's ways aren't our ways because God's ways are about God and his glory. And what are our ways about? Well, honestly, they're about us and our glory. That's why we're always looking, trying to find a righteousness of our own, always looking for a way to justify ourselves. In our pride, we want to say, I did that. I'm better than them. I'm worthy. They're not. I deserve God's favor and blessing. They don't. That's really what Jonah's thinking here. We don't always see it in ourselves, but we can see it easily in Jonah, can't we? Do you see that about yourself? Because of our sinful natures, our natural bent is to look to ourselves first. Turn away from God. If we don't understand that we have this desire to turn from God, to run from God, Satan's going to provide ships that are going to take us places that we never thought we could go. So why do we run from God? Well, like I said, the truth is we're born that way. We're born to run because we're born in sin. And sinful people can't stand to be in the presence of a holy God. Remember what happened with Adam and Eve. The moment they sinned, what did they do? They ran and hid from God. All of us have been doing that exact same thing ever since. You may not think you are because you show up at church or you say a prayer before a meal. But just stop. If you think that means you're not running from God, stop and think what God said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. What is God saying? there? All of Jewish religious practice had been corrupted, where it was no longer about the heart, but it was about rules taught by men. Traditions. Think of the people God's describing. There are people who practice religion and they feel good about themselves. They come near to God with their mouth, but their heart is far from God. And do you see what happens when that is your mindset? That was Jonah. He was a prophet of the Lord to Israel. But even as a prophet, his heart was far from God. And so Satan provides the ship and Jonah's gone, fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Even when Jonah finally does what God wants him to do, we're going to see there's not one place in this whole account where Jonah's heart really is in line with God's heart. Through this account, we're going to see two things are consistently true of Jonah because of his self-righteous pride. First, that pride will cause him, even as he preaches to the Assyrians, to look down on the Assyrians and pray for their demise rather than their salvation. And second, Jonah's self-righteous pride is constantly going to make him call into question everything God's doing. Because what God's doing isn't what Jonah thinks ought to be done. And Jonah thinks he's right and God's wrong. Because of his self-righteous pride, Jonah's heart is far from God, no matter what his lips might be saying. Same is true for us. We don't want to admit it. But if our hearts are filled with pride and self-righteousness, we'll be just like Jonah, honoring God with our lips. But our hearts will be far from him because our hearts will be set on ourselves. When you have a self-righteous heart like Jonah's, you're going to see yourself in one of two ways. And both of those ways are going to cause you to run from God rather than run to God. Satan's going to take advantage of those. He's going to give you a ship to go where your heart wants to go. In our quest for self-righteousness, if we think we're succeeding and we're pulling it off, we're going to be puffed up with pride. And Satan is going to give us ample opportunities to prove how good of people we really are so that we begin to think we don't need God. And if we're not succeeding, well, Satan's going to give us plenty of opportunities to feel like failures. He's going to keep rehearsing in our minds all the times we failed so that we feel worthless.
Do you realize what both those things will do? Feeling puffed up with pride or feeling worthless, they make you run from God. If you're puffed up with pride, then I don't need God. And if you feel worthless, you'll think God doesn't need me. Jonah couldn't preach sin and a message of grace to the Ninevites because he honestly didn't understand either of those concepts himself. We talk about them a lot, but do we really understand them? Jonah didn't understand the depths of his sin and the ways that he was running from God because he was honoring God with his lips, even though his heart was far from him. And because Jonah didn't understand how great a sinner he really was, he had no idea how great God's grace is. You cannot know grace without first knowing your sin and that you're born to run from God. Before we get to grace, let me show you what happens when we do run from God. It's illustrated very clearly in this passage from Jonah. We see very clearly the effect of sin on our lives. It's, it's very easy to see. We didn't read past verse 10, but you know how this story unfolds. In order to save the ship, Jonah is going to get thrown into the sea by the sailors. And then as he sinks up, sinks down into the sea, he's going to end up in the belly of a great fish. Now, knowing that background, let me point out to you what happens and a word specifically that occurs in verses 3, 5, 15, and 17. And it will show us clearly what the effect of sin is in our lives. First, Jonah 1, 3. Jonah went down to Joppa. Jonah 1, 5. Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship. Jonah 1, 15. Jonah goes down into the sea. In verse 17, Jonah goes down into the belt of a great fish. Do you see a trend? It's not a good trend line at all. The more Jonah tries to run from God, what happens the further down Jonah goes? Jonah knew that it was his running from God that had brought on the storm, but he refuses to repent and turn back to God. Do you see what running from God is going to do in your life? And maybe some of you are even experiencing it right now. I know I went through it for about 30 years. Running from God will take you on a downward spiral that will kill you little by little. Jonah called out to God finally, but it took a long time. God called Jonah. But in his pride, what did Jonah do? Jonah went down to Joppa and then down into the cargo hold of the ship. And then as God sent a storm to get Jonah's attention in his pride, Jonah decided it was better for the sailors to throw him down into the sea rather than to repent and have the ship turn around and take him back. Finally, God in his grace and mercy sends a great fish to get Jonah's attention. And we begin there to see a glimpse of God's grace. We see where Jonah's sin brought him down to the depths, the lowest depths of the sea. Now we see what grace does as it comes and meets us at our point of deepest need. Jonah could have experienced God's grace at any moment in this passage. He could have experienced it through immediate obedience that would have been the least painful for Jonah, right? If he'd just gone and preached at Nineveh, he would have seen God's grace unfold in amazing ways. Jonah could have experienced God's grace when the sailors woke him and said the ship was in trouble. Instead of saying, throw me in, he could have said, hey, let's turn around. This is all my fault. Take us back to port and I'll go do what God wants me to do. And I guarantee you, if I do that, the, you know, if you do that, turn around, take the ship back, the storm will stop. And everybody could have marveled at God's grace as Jonah repented. But Jonah stubbornly in his pride refused God's grace and he kept going further and further down to get away from God. But as Jonah sunk further and further, what did God's grace do? It reached deeper and deeper. Grace is God pursuing us 
as we run from him. Grace is God reaching down to rescue us as we sink down further and further into sin. You know, a lot of times as we read this story of Jonah, we see the storm, we see the fish, and we think these things are a punishment God inflicts upon Jonah. But they're not a punishment at all. They're God's grace. Look at Jonah 1 again. Look at verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. Verse 17. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Who hurled the storm? God did. Who appointed the great fish? God did. Why did God do those things? To rescue Jonah from his sin. The storms we encounter in life are from God. They're not from Satan. Just like we blame Satan for our sin, we blame trouble in our life on Satan. But a lot of times it's God in his grace. The problems of life that threaten to swallow us up, they're not from Satan. They're gifts of God's grace to pull us from the depths of our sin into his loving embrace. If you're running from God, I want you to know that Satan wants you to be comfortable. And he'll do everything to make you as comfortable as possible. He had Jonah fast asleep down in the hold of the ship. Satan will always be sending you a ship that will take you away. He'll always be giving you a quiet place in that rocking ship to lull you into the sleep and slumber of death. Satan is not sending the storms. God is sending you the storms as a means of grace to reclaim you. There's an old fairy tale that illustrates this very well. As with most children's fairy tales, there's an old wicked witch who lives in a deep, dark forest. And this wicked old witch, well, she had a wonderful, comfortable bed in a guest room that she offered to any traveler who wanted to spend the night there. The problem was that if you were still in bed as the sun came up, you would be turned to stone. And the worst part of the spell was that you would know you had been turned to stone. Your heart and your soul stayed trapped and you became a statue in the witch's garden. Well, as the tale goes, there's a young man who comes and stays at the witch's house. And after she gives him a warm meal, he begins to feel very drowsy and he decides rather than continue on his way, he'll spend the night in the guest bed. The witch has a young servant girl who falls in love with the young man and feels sorry for him and knows what's going to happen to him. So before the young man goes to bed, she throws all kinds of sticks and stones and thorns and thistles under the mattress, which make the bed very uncomfortable, and cause the young man to have a terrible night's rest. Because he's so uncomfortable, he gets up before dawn, And he gets out of bed. But because the sun hasn't risen, he's still alive. But he's very cranky because he didn't get a good night's sleep. As he gets ready to leave, the young man walks by the servant girl and he treats her very rudely. As the young man walks out the door to continue his journey, the servant girl calls out to him and says, the misery you know now really bothers you because you can't compare it to the misery your comfort would have brought. Don't you see that those were sticks and stones of love I threw in there? Do you see that in your life? Do you see that's what God's doing? When God breaks into your life, he does it out of love. He allows us to feel uncomfortable, to make us aware we're not in control of our lives. The storms that God sends into our lives are sticks and stones of love to keep us awake and to awaken us to God's grace. There's love always under the waves of the storm. Love that is there to drive us in to the embrace of God's grace. Think how God begins to work to turn Jonah's heart. As I said before, having never really experienced God's grace himself, Jonah was filled with pride and self-righteousness. You cannot share God's grace with others if you haven't first experienced it yourself. You can't reform others until you've been reformed by grace. 
Jonah could not bring a reformation to Nineveh until grace had reformed his own heart. Grace is at the heart of real reformation. We can try to do it apart from grace. We can try to do it in our own steam, trying to make ourselves better people, better morals, better theology, better whatever. But you know what better is going to do? <laughs> a quest for better is only going to make us either feel bigger, puffed up with pride, or bitter, despondent over our failure. We don't need to be better people. I know that sounds odd for a preacher to say. But we don't need to be better people. What we need to be is a people who have been reformed by the grace of God, transformed in our thinking, transformed in the way we live our life. Because everything we think and everything we do is empowered by God's grace. It's only when a storm comes that threatens to sink us that we stop our own efforts to make ourselves better and instead cry out to God to transform us, reform us through his grace and mercy. That's why God sends the storms to our life. Think about this. Why did God go to all the trouble of bringing the storm and the fish into Jonah's life? Why did God hurl the storm? Why did he appoint the fish? It was for one reason. It was because he wanted Jonah in Jonah's heart. God could have raised up just a different prophet. He could have been done with Jonah and wiped him out. But God didn't want a different prophet. He wanted Jonah. And he moved heaven and earth, literally, to have Jonah. Now think what God did because he wanted you. He appointed his son to come and live the life that you should have lived and then die the death you deserve to die because he loves you. He doesn't just send his son to die for you. He also sends storms of love that will drive you into his grace. To run to God, the first thing that has to happen is we have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to come to the end of our self-sufficiency. We have to be humbled into realizing we're far more wicked than we ever dreamed we could be. But we also have to come to understand we are far more loved than we could ever hope to be loved. If you're in the storm, if the waves seem like they're sweeping over you and pulling you under, will you look to God? Will you trust God? Would you see that beneath the waves, there's love and mercy and grace? God has not sent waves and storms of life to drown you, but to call you to true repentance, to make you run to him rather than from him. Look at the cross and see how God moved heaven and earth to have you as his own. Seeing your Savior on the cross, it is going to destroy every last ounce of self-righteousness and pride in you. Because think what the cross tells you about yourself. You are so desperately wicked that God's own son had to die for you. God's own son had to endure the storm of God's wrath, and he did it for you. How righteous can you be if Jesus had to die for your sin? But also look at the cross, and what else do you see? You see love, you see grace, you see mercy, and it's all for you. Because no matter how hard you've tried to run from God, God has pursued you. And he has loved you so much that he literally moved heaven and earth to send his son for you, to have you in your heart. Jack Miller had an expression he was famous for, cheer up. You're a worse sinner than you ever dared imagine, and you're more loved than you ever dared hope. Understanding that is the first step of being reformed in an unreformed world. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and we're so intent often on religion and self-righteousness, making ourselves into better people, trying to live life and reform ourselves in our own steam and own power. Father, would you help us look to the cross and see how desperately sinful and wicked we are that you had to send your son to die. It was the only solution. 
And then help us to look at the cross and see grace and love and mercy. And see how loved we are that you would do that for us. May that cheer our hearts and conform us day by day into the image of our Savior so that we are a people who live like Jesus. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.